Hello, I'm Julia. I'm part of the support team at Overcome. So I am one of the people who answers your calls and in emails and messages if there's anything that we can help with or if you ever want to talk anything through. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Miller in just a moment. Um, just a quick word about the, the timings and the, and the format. Um, the presentation is going to last for sort of half an hour or so. So we'll then have um, maybe sort of 20, 20, 25 minutes to to um, address as many of your questions as we can, and then we'll be finishing promptly at seven. If there are any questions or topics that we haven't managed to to fit in in the in the time, um, Dr. Miller's very kindly said that she will take a look at those and we'll perhaps get some answers from her that we can circulate to everybody afterwards. And so. Following on from that, I will hand over to Dr. Miller, who's going to talk to us about updates in research. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can see the slides. Um, so I've been tasked by giving an update on ovarian cancer research. I did a very similar talk around Christmas time, so there will be some repetition, but also we've got some updates, and I think it's always quite nice to go over stuff just to get it clear. Um, I'm a medical oncology consultant. I work between two hospitals in London, uh, UCL Hospital here, which is on the Euston Road, the most polluted road in London, and Bart's, which is down the road with this nice quad where we can sit and have our lunch. So you can imagine where my preference to be is when I have the free time. Um, I'm really happy to do this with Overcome. Um, I've done a bit of work with them before. I think they're a great charity and they really help support all of our patients. Um, um, there. Um, this is a picture of me for those of you who can't see me. Uh, Victoria, the Overcome CEO, I wouldn't say bullied was the right word, but she strongly persuaded me to um, do a race in the Overcome ovary outfit. And this is me in my office at Bart's trying it on for size. I wasn't quite as happy when I was running in it, that's for sure. Anyway, as an overview, we're going to talk today about some updates in clinical trial research. Um, firstly, with something new in surgery, which is quite exciting because um, there hasn't been many new surgical advances for some time. As with all ovary cancer talks recently, I'm going to give you an update about the Arab, so that's the PARPs, the Laparib, Neraparib and Recaparib, which have really transformed the management of ovarian cancer. And then we'll touch on immunotherapy and some rare tumours, uh, rare ovarian cancer subtypes. So just as a what's happened in cancer conferences, so the biggest cancer conference that we have is ASCO. This is one that happens in the US every year and it's 60,000 people, um, all, mostly oncologists, all gather together in Chicago and obviously for obvious reasons that didn't happen. So instead of having these big conferences where the pl plenary sessions be given to like 15,000 people, everything's gone online um, and cancer conferences have been attended sitting at home and the only advantage I can think of is sometimes you can ha enjoy a glass of wine alongside it but really as with everything there's been a big shift in the way that we have been receiving our uh, up updated research. So firstly with regards to what's happened in surgery, at ASCO this year, they presented the results from the DESTROP3 trial. So this follows on from DESTROP1 and 2, but it's an international trial, um, surgical trial, looking at the role of surgery for recurrent ovarian cancer. That's cancer that's come back after first line treatment with chemotherapy and surgery. And it had quite strict criteria for entry. Um, it had to be at least six months since um, patients had finished their first chemotherapy, although the majority of patients, this was well over a year. When looking at the CT scan, there had to be very small uh, amount of ascites, which is fluid in the tummy or no ascites at all. Ladies had to be very fit and well with no significant other medical problems. And importantly, um, at the time of the first operation, if all the cancer had to have been removed and the feeling from the MDT, that's our multidisciplinary meeting, was that the imaging on this, the disease on the scan, the cancer on the scan was considered to be removable. And what this study did is there were 400 patients, um, as I said, platinum sensitive relapse, and they were randomized um, to receive, to undergo either an operation or no operation, and then everybody was recommended to receive platinum-based chemotherapy. So this would be the normal care, the standard of care would be chemotherapy, um, but for the trial purposes, they um, had the operation first, and they were looking at long-term outcomes. And what this study showed that overall, the patients who underwent surgery did better in that cancer was controlled for longer, overall survival was longer. But important caveat was that the outcome was only better when the surgeon, surgeon could remove all the macroscopic cancer, all the cancer they could see at the time of surgery. And in fact, if, if that wasn't possible, um, 
people did better off not having an operation. But the majority of patients that were able to remove all the cancer, and really this is practice changing because what it suggests is that we should be considering an operation for all suitable patients. So um, for anyone who the cancer comes back and they fit the criteria, we're now considering um, another operation. And um, so this is the first big sort of changing practice from a surgical point of view in the ovarian cancer landscape in some time. We've already been practicing this at, at, at my hospitals. Um, secondly, let's see what's happening with all the new PARP inhibitors. So as a bit of a background, um, I don't know, can you, I can only see myself if, I don't know if you can all see the, the, the full screen. Here we go. So um, PARP inhibitors, these are the ones that we have available, uh, pictures of them. Um, they're a tablet treatment. It's targeted therapy and they inhibit this specific protein called PARP, which stands for poly ADP ribose polymerase, which I never remember unless I write it down, but everybody knows them as PARP inhibitors. And it, it's important to note that this is not chemotherapy. It works in a completely different way. It's a targeted therapy. And it's nearly always used as what we call maintenance treatment after chemotherapy. So um, when the chemotherapy, someone's received all the chemotherapy and it's worked, we use the PARP inhibitors to try and maintain the response that chemotherapy has induced. And as I said, there's three currently licensed for use um, in ovarian cancer, Alaparib, Niraparib and Ricaparib, and in brackets is the brand name for the drugs. So just a bit of basic biology, we are all made up of billions of cells and cancers of, of themselves got millions of cells and within each cell there's the nucleus, that's the kind of brain or the operating part of the cell where, where everything happens. Within the nucleus we've got our chromosomes, we've each got 23 pairs of chromosomes and within the chromosomes you've got this tightly packed DNA, that's our genetic material. And each fragment of DNA, there's two strands, they're matched with these um, nucleotides and a sort of fraction of DNA or a portion of DNA is called a gene. And this is something that has a specific function. So the genes, for example, will make a protein um, that has a function in the cell. And the most relevant genes for ovarian cancer are BRCA1 and BRCA2. And in terms of BRCA mutations, um, this is something that we, we now test everyone with a diagnosis of high grade ovarian cancer for. So there's two types of BRCA mutation. So BRCA, as I said, is a gene and a mutation just means an abnormality in the gene. And you can either have a germline mutation. This is one that's present in every cell in the body and it's inherited. Um, you, so therefore you could detect it in a blood sample, but you will also find it in the tumor. And about 12 to 15% of, of patients with ovarian cancer will have an inherited or a germline BRCA mutation. And then on the other side, there's something called a somatic mutation. So that's an abnormality in the BRCA gene that's occurred as the cancer is developed. So it's not present, present in the person, but it's, it's one of the many genes that cancer gets as it developed. So this, what, these people have a negative blood test, but if you test the tumor, you'll find the BRCA mutation. So this is important for treatment implications, but it is not, um, doesn't affect other members of the family. And about five to seven percent of of ladies with ovarian cancer will have this type of mutation. So overall, about twenty to twenty five percent of ovarian cancer will have some form of BRCA mutation, which is relevant when we talk about treatment with PARP inhibitors. I'm just going to take you through a few slides of very um, basic um, biology, just to try and explain why these drugs are important. So our DNA, the genes and the DNA are under constant attack, both from exogenous, so this means external sources, so thing, examples of this would be uh, UV or ionizing radiation, chemicals, infections, particularly viral infections cause, can cause DNA damage, or endogenous, this is something within the cell itself, um, and as, the D, as DNA replicates as the cells divide, it can have um, defects. If cells are dividing quickly, such as in the case of cancer, they get put under what we call replication stress which can cause lots of damage to DNA and then the generation of oxygen uh, radicals can cause DNA damage and oxygen radicals are relevant because this is what antioxidants work against. As I said the DNA is made of these two sort of parallel strands and you can get damaged into one strand which is called a single strand break and it's repaired by a variety of different processes in the cell but if the cell can't fix this then at the time when the cell undergoes division as all cells do it may become a double strand break 
um, uh, or you can get a de novo uh, spontaneous double strand break from any of these causes. And double strand breaks are a bit harder to repair because you don't have the, the parallel strand to copy from, but it can be done and, and cells are very clever at doing this. We've got two main ways of doing it, homologous recombination and non-homologous end joining. And the reason that this is important is because the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene control homologous recombination. So if you have a deficiency in the BRCA gene, the cells can't repair their DNA this way as effectively. Now, under normal circumstances, that doesn't matter because you've got other means of DNA repair, sort of parallel processes. However, if you inhibit, if you give a PARP inhibitor, that inhibits all of these processes. And therefore, um, with time, with the use of PARP inhibitor in a BRCA cell, you get this accumulation of DNA damage in the cancer cells um, and they can't uh, repair themselves and this ultimately leads to cell death. And this is why PARP inhibitors um, are so successful in BRCA cancers and indeed PARP was first developed as a treatment for a BRCA cancer. Um, this is a concept known as synthetic lethality, which is now used commonly in cancer, but uh, this is the, the first example of it. So if you take the two separate proteins uh, in genes, BRCA and PARP, if you've got them both functioning normally, the cell survives. If you've got a BRCA abnormality, but you've still got PARP functioning, the cell survives. And if you inhibit something with PARP, like in a normal tissue, but the BRCA is okay, you get cell survival. But if you take them both out at the same time, the cell dies. Um, and this is, as I said, is known as synthetic lethality. And I suppose a way to think about it would be is if, for example, you had a four-legged table, if one leg comes off, the table will still stand, but if the second leg fall gets removed, the table can't stand. So it's a similar concept. You can cope with the, some abnormality, but not with both things being removed at the same time. So that's just a little bit of background into PARP inhibitors and BRCA, but it's important to notice, note with time, the details of this pie chart are not important, not relevant, but um, the all, there's a number of other abnormalities in an ovarian cancer cell that cause the same sensitivity to PARP as a BRCA mutation. So you get abnormalities in all these different genes and this whole half of the pie chart, about 60%, will have some abnormality in some, in some gene or protein that causes the same defect as a BRCA mutation. So what we call HR deficient or homologous recombination deficient. It means they can't repair their DNA that way and therefore are um, potentially sensitive to PARP inhibitors. And that's relevant when we go on to talk about the more recent clinical trials. So up until 2018, the only PARP inhibitor available was Alaparib. This was given in capsule formulation. Um, it subsequently changed to ta tablets, but the capsules, I think it was about 12 uh, capsules everyone had, patients had to take a day. And these are massive horse-like tablets. So it's good that we've been able to switch them to tablets. Um, it was given as maintenance therapy after chemotherapy only for BRCA cancer and only after someone had received three lots of platinum-based chemotherapy. Um, it was nice approved, but overall this was only benefit to a small number of patients. And this really all was transformed at a conference at the end of 2018 where um, there was the presentation of the NOVA trial. So the NOVA trial looked at niraparib treatment which is another PARP inhibitor. This was for ladies who had recurrent ovarian cancer, so ovarian cancer that had returned. It was a placebo-controlled trial, and it was for people after platinum-based chemotherapy. So 530 patients, about 200 had a BRCA mutation. G-BRCA means a germline BRCA mutation, and the remainder didn't have a BRCA mutation. They received six cycles of platinum-based, so that's carboplatin-based chemotherapy, either on its own or in combination with another drug such as paclitaxel or Calix. And then they were randomized two to one, which means two patients out of three would receive the niraparib and one out of three would receive the placebo. And the treatment was um, continued whilst patients were benefiting. And what this showed that it significantly delayed time until the cancer uh, uh, progressed. At um, two years, 40% of the patients with ladies with a BRCA mutation and a third of the non-BRCA patients remained on drug and free from cancer progression. It delayed time until further chemotherapy was required. And they looked at um, different age groups, so those under 17 and those over 17, it was equally effective and tolerated. But what they did notice this was that two thirds, in fact, over two thirds of patients required a reduction in the dose um, because of side effects, particularly uh, low platelet count. Um, 
and I'll just come on to that in a minute, but overall there was no effect on quality of life and it was considered well tolerated. What we were able to show this year at the at our most recent me meeting was that reducing the dose because of side effects didn't compromise the drug working. So the drug was equally effective in those that received um, the original dose, which was 300 or three tablets versus 200 versus 100. And actually now it's been recommended that um, most of the majority of patients get started on a lower dose so hopefully there'll be less toxicity and less side effects so it's very reassuring to see this recent data suggesting that the dose reduction doesn't compromise efficacy as i said we've now recommend a slightly lower starting dose for most people and this drug has been available on the cancer drugs fund for the last couple of years and it's not dependent on whether you have a BRCA mutation or not we earlier this year we had the updated results from the solo 2 trial so this is again for recurrent ovarian cancer but the difference with this trial is one it's a lapra which is a different PARP inhibitor and two it was just for um, patients with a BRCA mutation so two nearly 300 patients with a BRCA mutation six cycles of chemotherapy as before and again randomized two to one in this case to receive um, limpasa or a laparib and placebo and similar to the last trial, it significantly delayed time until cancer progressed. But importantly, this is the first trial to show this because it was one of the earliest trials to start. It in significantly increased long-term survival. So the delay in cancer progression translated into improved uh, long-term survival. Um, it also delayed time until further chemotherapy was required. And Interestingly, almost a quarter of the patients remained on the Alapra treatment for more than five years, um, suggesting that it was tolerable and also that it controlled treat, uh, cancer for a long time. This has been um, approved on the Cancer Drugs Fund for some time. It, as I said before, it was originally for patients after third line chemotherapy, but now it's possible to give um, Alapra only for those with a BRCA mutation. Um, after second line treatment. And the BRCA mutation can be an inherited one or one that's just found in the tumour. Interestingly, last year we looked at moving PARP inhibitors, or sorry, two years ago, into the first line setting. So the SOLO1 trial, this was a study looking at Alaprip after chemotherapy and surgery at the time of initial diagnosis. So ladies with stage three or four cancer who had a BRCA mutation, who'd had um, chemotherapy, um, nearly 400 patients, they had to have received six cycles of chemotherapy and, and surgery where it was technically possible. So most people had undergone either primary surgery or interval surgery. And I, as per the other trials, randomized two to one to receive uh, Olaparib or placebo. And the difference with this in the previous trials is that this is in the first line setting. And the results of this trial um, this is the most impressive clinical trial results that I have ever seen and most of my colleagues have ever seen. It really led to a substantial unprecedented improvement in outcome, at least a three-year improvement in controlling cancer. Um, more than 60% of patients were free from recurrence at three years. Um, um, generally very well tolerated. The treatment was only given for, for two years after completion of chemotherapy and this treatment received approval from the Cancer Drugs Fund last summer. And as I said, this is one of the, the most impressive trial results has been seen not just in ovarian cancer research, but in oncology in general. And I don't like to normally agree with the son, but I think on this occasion they were right. It is a wonder drug and a game changer. And the important thing is we give this in the first line setting. And this is the, the chance, the, the best chance that we have for cure. And um, again, it was widely reported in the press, um, quite rightly, I think. But what about that, that, that Alapra was just approved for uh, people with a BRCA mutation, which is, as you remember, I said was about 20, 25% of patients. What about those without a BRCA mutation? Well, last autumn at our ESMO conference in Barcelona, there were three studies presented that looked at, at asked this, exactly this question. So looking at all patients, regardless of BRCA status, um, the two trials, the PRIMA and the Paolo study, the PRIMA study used the drug PARP inhibitor Neraparib after chemotherapy, um, newly diagnosed stage three or four 
regardless of BRCA status. But what they did in addition to testing for BRCA is they did HRD testing. And HRD, if you remember that pie chart I showed you, that stands for homologous recombination deficient. So that's um, defective or imperfect means of repairing DNA. So there's a spe specific test we can do to look for this in addition to BRCA testing. There were 733 patients on the trial, of which 233 were BRCA. Um, again, as before, chemotherapy and surgery where possible, and then randomised to receive uh, niraparib or placebo. Now, this trial was started before the results of the other trial were available. It wouldn't now be possible to conduct a trial in this setting where we gave uh, uh, patients uh, Plus, uh, with a BRCA mutation placebo because we know that uh, PARP inhibitors are so um, dramatically effective in this setting. But when this trial started many years ago, that, that data wasn't available. And again, similarly, niraparib significantly improved outcome for all patients, increasing time free from cancer. The benefit was greatest in the BRCA patients, but it was also very significant in the patients without a BRCA mutation, particularly those with a HRD or defective DNA repair. Um, they report no effect on quality of life, although I mean, our experiences is that these drugs, particularly when first started, do have some side effects, but they tend to get better with time. And this brings up the questions whether niraparib should be available for all patients. It's currently under approval by the Cancer Drugs Fund and NICE. I think it's this month that we're expecting an outcome, but we do currently have access to it. Um, available via what's called a compassionate access program. So the drug company are providing the drug um, for patients without, for ladies without a BRCA mutation after first line chemotherapy. So we do have access to it and hopefully NICE will follow suit and approve this drug. As I said, its decision is expected imminently. The second study are very similar. So you, you, you can see a, th a theme with these. They're all very similar in design, this study. Um, but this, again, newly diagnosed ovary cancer stage three or four with platinum-based chemotherapy, uh, included BRCA, non-BRCA, did HRD testing. But the difference with this trial was that um, we had chemotherapy, but with Avastin, which we are able to give in some settings in the UK. This trial was performed in Europe where most people, nearly everybody would receive Avastin. Um, and patients also had surgery where possible and randomised two to one to receive a laparip or placebo, but everybody received Avastin. And so even those on placebo would have received the Avastin. So um, for those of you not familiar, Avastin is an antibody drug. It inhibits new blood vessel formation. And in order for cancer cells to, to grow and survive, they need to get their own blood supply. So this, these drugs work by interfering with that. And in the, in the UK, we can give Avastin in, under certain criteria. Um, for patients with advanced disease. Um, and what this, this study showed that if you add a laparib to bevacizumab, it improves time free from cancer. Um, the benefit was greatest in the BRCA patient, but there was also a significant benefit in the non-BRCA patient who were HRD. So remember that pie chart, the patients who, who had defective homologous recombination repair. But interestingly, in the patients who, the ladies who didn't have HRD, there was no benefit of a laparib in addition to Avastin. So in this group of patients, Avastin is probably the best drug to use. Again, this is currently under NICE review with a decision expected imminently. And there's not yet a European license for this combination, but the FDA, this is the American Food and Drugs Authority, have approved this combination for any ovarian cancers with either a BRCA mutation or HRD. So if you remember from that pie chart I showed you, that's this group of patients um, who would potentially benefit from that. Um, and this group are the ones that probably best served with Avastin rather than a PARP inhibitor in this setting. Just as an update, um, Rucaparib was also approved in 2019, uh, the study very similar to the one with Niraparib and very similar results. Um, so what this means is that in pe people with recurrent ovarian cancer who respond to platinum, um, who don't have a BRCA mutation, they can have either Niraparib or Rucaparib. And the good thing now is that we are allowed to swap between the two drugs if uh, there's significant side effects on one as long as it's in the, within the first three months of starting. So I think it's fair to say that each of the PARP inhibitors 
um, in terms of efficacy or, or how well they work, it's very similar, but they've got slightly different side effect profile, the nuances, um, and some people may tolerate one better than the other. So that this is something that's, that's new on the Cancer Drugs Fund, allowing us to switch between the two. So that's great if someone starts one and doesn't tolerate, we can switch to the other one. And this is for BRCA and non-BRCA, and it doesn't matter what the HRD status is. Um, increasingly, we're looking at combination therapy with PARP inhibitors and predominantly whether we can give these tablet treatments as treatment instead of chemotherapy. So as you notice with all those trials I showed you, everybody received chemotherapy first and then was randomized to receive the PARP inhibitor or not. This study, it was an American study um, recently presented, which looked at uh, people with platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer, BRCA, non-BRCA, and what they looked at is whether um, a laparib on its own or the combination of a laparib and sidernib was as good as or better than standard chemotherapy in this setting. So can we spare people having to undergo chemotherapy with the associated toxicity? Now, sidernib is another tablet treatment. It's basically a tablet version of Avastin or Bevacizumab. So it works again by inhibiting blood vessel formation. And there's some very nice data from the lab that suggests that these drugs work very well together. And this addition of sidernib increases the effectiveness of a lap rib. As I said, this study included people with a BRCA mutation, those without. So there was 110 BRCA patients and the remainder um, did not have a BRCA mutation. And what they, the, the doctors who ran the study were able to show that for non-BRCA patients, the combination of a laparib and sidernib, so the two tablet treatment, was as effective as chemotherapy in controlling the cancer. And for BRCA patients, both the combination of a laparib and sidernib and a laparib on its own were equally effective as, as chemotherapy, suggesting that for those with a BRCA mutation, a laparib on its own is probably enough, and those without, maybe the combination is, is more effective. However, it's worth pointing out that there were significantly higher rates of side effects in the combination group, and particularly tiredness or fatigue, diarrhea, and high blood pressure. And many people required a reduction in the dose of the sidernib. And actually, when you look at the reported side effects, some of these were significantly higher than with chemotherapy. So I think it's more trials are required before we can ditch chemotherapy in favour of tablet treatment. It may just be that this particular drug is, is what we call a bit of a dirty drug. So it's a target of therapy, but it has a lot of off-target effects, which can cause the side effects. And maybe that the combination with a laparib and other drugs would be more effective. And certainly there's lots of trials looking at this now. So for the time being, um, chemotherapy is still the standard with PARP as maintenance. However, what we are looking at is whether if you've had chemotherapy, um, using this combination after chemotherapy is more effective than using a laparib on its own. So that's the ICON-9 study that's running in multiple centres throughout the UK. Um, and as I said, that, that looks at maintenance treatment with the combination of the two tablets versus a laparib alone. And then the October study is very similar randomization to this trial I've just discussed, but it's in platinum resistant disease, seeing whether the combination of a laparib and sidernib is as effective as chemotherapy in this setting. Um, the October study is closed to recruitment, so hopefully we'll have the results soon. And the ICON-9 study is still ongoing and actively recruiting if anybody is interested in participating. In addition to the, the one I've just presented, there was a very small study which looked at niraparib, the other part, and bevacizumab, which had very encouraging early results. And actually, this combination was better tolerated than the one with sidernib. So I think there's definitely promise in this, in combining the drugs that target blood vessels with PARP, but a bit more work is required before they become standard of care. What about other combinations? There's always a lot of interest in immunotherapy. And I think immunotherapy, I get asked about this, probably one of the questions I get asked about most in terms of treatment. Immunotherapy has revolutionized the treatment of certain types of cancer, particularly uh, lung cancer or melanoma and skin cancer. And <clears throat> Just a bit about how immunotherapy works. We probably all develop tiny cancers all the time, but our own immune system recognises the cancer cells as, as foreign, as abnormal and not supposed to be there and, and gets rid of it. But in order for a cancer to become established and develop and grow, it has to hide from the immune system and it builds this protective shield 
for want of a better word, around the cancer, that means the immune cells which are circulating around just cannot see the cancer, they can't see it as abnormal. If you think about it like an almost like an invisible cloak, so the immune cells are there but they don't see the cancer. And how immunotherapy works is it removes that shield, it, it switches on the immune system to recognize the cancer cells as abnormal and therefore attack them. So the immunotherapy itself doesn't kill the cancer cells, it, 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 ha it switches on our own immune system to target the um, cancer cells. And the immunotherapy on single agent immunotherapy in ovarian cancer has been a little bit disappointing to date. And it's probably because ovary cancer is a relatively what we call cold tumor in that when you look at it under the microscope, there's not a lot of immune cells there compared to a smoking related lung cancer or a skin cancer when you look at them under the microscope they've got lots of immune cells in so we probably need to do something to activate the immune system in ovarian cancer in order for immunotherapy to work um, at the ASCO meeting this year, they presented the Keynote 100 study. This is the biggest immunotherapy study in ovarian cancer. It wasn't a randomized trial, so everybody on the trial received immunotherapy with a drug called pembrolizumab, which is uh, used routinely in lots of different cancers. Um, it, it's for people with platinum res resistant disease. And overall, the response rates were, it was a bit disappointing. So there was only a response in about one in 10 patients. Um, which was significantly less than we'd expect to see in chemotherapy. However, some of the people that responded did extremely well for a, a very long time. So work is ongoing to identify the group of patients who benefit and try and pick out those ones so that we can offer immunotherapy to those that are really like to benefit. However, it looks like certainly in lab uh, laboratory experiments that PARP inhibitors may sensitize to immunotherapy, the damage that they do to the cells seems to make immunotherapy more effective um, for want of a better way we make these cold tumors hot and therefore immunotherapy the immune cells can get into them and do, and do their magic and there's a number of trials ongoing or just finished so in the first line setting um, these trials are all all being run or have just finished in the UK looking at combinations of different PARP inhibitors with immunotherapy and um, they're all very similar to, they're just run by different companies and in recurrent disease there's again a whole host of um, trials either underway or just finishing looking at this very question do does treatment with PARP inhibitor make immunotherapy more effective and it's slightly unfortunate timing that this talk is today and not next week because the ESMA, which is the European Big Cancer Conference, is happening this weekend and they're presenting the results from this trial, which the word on the street is, is very effective combination. So it's looking at a laparib and an immunotherapy drug called Durvulumab in BRCA, non-BRCA patients, and it seems to be quite an effective combination. And it may be that that combination is something that we can think about replacing chemotherapy with in the future. So I haven't got anything, any updated results for the, this combination but just to say watch the space because there's certainly a lot happening and hopefully in the next you know 12 months we should get some updates. What about the rarer subtypes? Now this um, pie chart is all, nearly all the trials that we've discussed so far have been uh, conducted in high-grade series or high-grade series and endometrioid um, ovarian cancer. So epithelial ovarian cancer, this is the sort of distribution of disease. The majority are high-grade series, particularly the more advanced disease, about nearly 90% of people with stage three and four disease will have high-grade series. But there are a number of other subtypes which represent a um, significant number of patients. And th these subtypes of ovarian cancer, so clear cell, mucinous, low-grade ovarian cancer, and then some very, very real ones such as transitional, um, are really biologically very different diseases. So when you look at the mutations in the genes or the protein expression, these cancers um, are very distinct from high-grade serous. And in fact, for example, clear cell cancer of the ovary um, molecularly looks much more like clear cell kidney cancer than it does other subtypes of ovarian cancer. So there's an increasing recognition that the rarer subtypes represent distinct diseases and that should be, should be looking at individualized treatment for them. Um, Low-grade serous ovarian cancer is a specific subtype, so it's less than 10% of patients. Because it's low-grade, the, the tumour cells tend to grow slower and therefore, as a consequence, are, slightly, are less sensitive to chemotherapy in general. But they have overactivation of the MAP growth factor pathway. So this cartoon is of a, a, of a cell. This is the nucleus, the sort of engine or the brain of the cell. And then on the outside of the cell, the cell surface, all of our cells have multiple receptors 
um, and these are sort of like baskets that in this case they they collect growth factors or hormones that are circulating in the blood and they sink single down this pathway and they tell the cell to grow and divide um, and this particular pathway is overactivated or abnormal in a high, very high number of low grade ovarian cancer cells and the reason that this is important is because there's drugs that inhibit this and um, one of them being trametinib so we've recently had the results of the LOGS trial this was a trial in in people with recurrent low-grade ovarian cancer um, and they were randomized to receive trametinib which is a, a MEK inhibitor so it works on this pathway here or standard of care which for low-grade cancer can either be chemotherapy or it could be hormone anti-hormone therapy such as letrozole or tamoxifen and what this study demonstrated was that trametinib was more much more effective at controlling cancer for at least six months more than standard treatment be that chemotherapy or hormone therapy Interesting, the people that received the, the chemotherapy or the hormone therapy were allowed to have trametinib at a later date and they continue to benefit. And the great news is very recently in the last month is this is now available on the NHS via the Cancer Drugs Fund. So that's just happened in the last month. So anyone with a low grade cancer who's had previous treatment is eligible for trametinib. Um, so that's the first sort of personalised medicine for this particular subgroup of, of cancers. And there's a follow-up trial looking at combination therapy in uh, low-grade ovarian cancer, which I think will open in the UK probably at some point next year. Clear cell ovarian cancer, again, a unique subgroup, um, probably um, more sensitive to immunotherapy when you look at the molecular markers of it. And in fact, of that big study I reported, the response rate in clear cell cancer was significantly higher. So there's a couple of studies underway in the UK looking at clear cell cancer specifically. Um, I'll de declare that I have a complete conflict of interest because the PCOT trial is, is my trial, but it's an immunotherapy trial um, for people with clear cell ovarian cancer. It's being run throughout the UK at a number of different centres. It's not randomised, everybody gets immunotherapy. And then there's a second trial looking at um, a lap of the PARP inhibitor with another drug called ATR, which looks to be in the lab at least very effective in clear cell ovarian cancer. So both of these trials are currently running in the UK at many different sites and are looking for um, people with clear cell cancer. So it's nice to see um, specific trials directed at rare cancer subtypes. I just wanted to highlight um, that we also have the Rango study. This is really just a, a currently just a data collection looking at rare cancers, not just ovary, but any gynecological cancers. And then there's another study coming, I haven't got the name, where they're looking at, again, rare subtypes of ovarian cancer, mucinous, clear cell, low grade, looking at doing genetic testing. And then there's what's called a basket study, which means there's lots of different treatments and they'll match your the genetic abnormality to the treatment. And that will probably be opening in the latter half of next year, um, looking at specific treatments for very rare cancers. I just wanted to highlight that we have lots of upcoming trials and um, it's a really exciting time to be involved in ovarian cancer research. There's loads of clinical trials in ongoing. A question we often get asked now is with PARP inhibitors now being almost universal for people at, after initial diagnosis, is there been any benefit from PARP again after second line chemotherapy? And there's some studies looking at that giving PARP again, a um, study called the OREO study or looking at combination treatment. There's a whole host of trials coming through at looking at platinum resistant disease. We've got a vaccine therapy study um, giving vaccine dendritic cells or immune cell vaccines in combination with platinum based chemotherapy. There's a number of different targeted therapy studies coming through and increasingly immunotherapy combination studies either with PARP or with a double immunotherapy. So there's lots happening in the field and hopefully over the next 12 to 24 months these trials will be open recruiting and we'll get some updated results and new things to share with you and also new treatments available. I wanted to touch very briefly on COVID and clinical trials. Um, during March and April when COVID was really at its peak and the hospitals were really under lots of pressure, most clinical trials were halted to recruitment either by the hospitals or by the sponsors or the people that run the trials. And um, Anyone who was on a clinical trial, certainly the institutions I work at, continued on treatment and were able to deliver that safely. Um, mitigation has been put in place so that if things get bad again with COVID we won't have to stop clinical trials because we recognise that it's important that they continue. 
um, and also um, as much as possible has been done to reduce hospital admissions. So where possible, um, a lot of the sponsors of the clinical trials are letting us doing telephone consultations and things like that. So that we hope to be able to continue recruiting and opening new studies, which is clearly important because we have lost some time in terms of research over the last six months. So finally, I just wanted to say it really is a, is a great time to be involved in ovarian cancer research. There's so much happening. We've had real practice changing results in the last few years. You know, between carboplatin was approved for ovarian cancer in 1989 and paclitaxel in 1992. And it wasn't until 2014 that another drug got approval in ovarian cancer, which was bevacizumab. And since then, there's been in excess of uh, 15, not necessarily new drugs, but drugs for different indications that have been approved. So it really has is been a great time to be involved in ovarian cancer research. And there's so much happening that this is going to escalate and continue to improve. Many of the trials recently have been practice changing, so they've shown a significant benefit. Lots of new drugs are now available, thankfully available on the NHS. And I think it's important that we're increasingly focusing on either rare subtypes, such as mucinous or clear, but also subgroups so we're not treating all even high grade serious the same so we're looking at groups of BRCA or HRD or people without HRD and it's increasingly recognised that it's not one size fits all and it's becoming more and more personalised. So I want to thank you for your time and show you this is the BART's MDT um, doing the run in the dreaded ovary costume and um, we shared the pain it was actually not particularly aerodynamic um, quite hot and a little bit smelly to run in it but we did it and we raised about £2,000 to overcome so it was a nice team thing to do so thank you to Victoria and the team for persuading us to take on the challenge and I believe that the ovary is available should anyone else want to use it. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and like we said I'm happy to be contacted afterwards if anyone has any specific questions. Well, fantastic, thank you ever so much for packing so much into uh, into one talk. I'm sure everyone's found that really, really informative and really helpful. And as we can tell from all the all the questions that we've that we've got coming in. So we'll um, we'll get to as many of those as we as we can. Uh, we've had a question about you mentioned the desktop three trial right at the right at the beginning of your of your presentation. And we've had a question about whether that can be whether you can have further surgery um, even after second or third line chemotherapy. So the the inclusion for that trial it was only after first line treatment after first line chemotherapy. So um, to have surgery after second or third line chemotherapy would be in the absence of any evidence so that's not to say it would never be considered but it would be uncommon to do it in that setting um, but I, you know if there was a specific indication it would be considered but that the nice thing about this trial is it really supports the role of surgery in the second line but before second line chemotherapy. Great thank you. Uh, there's a question about getting access to your slides I mean the recording of the webinar is going to be made available so the slides will be visible on that but um, would you be happy for us to yeah, that's, that's share fine, the slides yeah. with anybody who would like them? Mm -hmm. And we have a question. As long as you don't share the picture of me in the ovary out. <laughs> we also have a question about um, joining clinical trials. If mm. uh, if anybody's interested in just interested in exploring what trials might be available to them, or if they've heard about a particular trial and they're interested in joining it, what would you recommend that they do? Yeah, so that's it. So if it's a specific trial they're interested in, you can look it up on the clinical trials.gov website which will normally give you the um the lead center so you can contact them so that would be to contact the trial sponsor um usually most oncologists will know about what trials are running so they could always ask the local oncologist to refer them if, if you're not at a center which is doing the trial um you know we're always happy to take patients from anywhere you know to, to participate in trials um, I think Target Ovarian Cancer and CRUK sometimes have their trials listed on and, and where what the participating centres are there isn't a we're trying to set up and Cancer Research UK are, are, are funding a, a sort of trial finder whereby you would put in your condition and they would say what trials there were and where they're available but that hasn't yet is not yet quite up and running so it is a little bit of word of mouth but I think the best thing is to approach your own oncologist and then they would be able to they should know where it was because the, through the NCRI network most people know what's going on. Okay 
and and we had an, a request for a bit of a recap about the definition of HRD and what that what that okay. means. So uh, HRD. So this is a bit of a new buzzword in ovary cancer. Um, so. HR, HR stands for homologous recombination and HRD stands for homologous recombination deficiency and maybe if I go my just go up to the slide to show it and um, so it's, it's a, a type of means of DNA repair by which the cell um, repair their DNA let me just bring up this picture again can I share my screen again is that yes so um if we look at the different, there's basically five types of DNA repair. That's how the cell fixes damage. And the most accurate one is this one called homologous recombination. And if you have a, a defect, particularly in the BRCA gene, but in a, a number of other genes that control proteins or parts of this pathway, you can't repair by homologous recombination. So um, in that pie chart I showed you, so there's the BRCA abnormalities, they cause what we call homologous recombination deficient, but also there's mutations or abnormalities in a whole host of other genes, which are all present in a small number of cancers, but they cause the same phenotype, the same effect as basically the cells can't repair their DNA very well. So it's a weakness in the cell that means they're not able to repair their DNA effectively. And that specific weakness seems to target them for PARP inhibitors or drugs like PARP inhibitors. And platinum is another one that is worked particularly well for, for HRD. Um, hopefully with the results of the Paolo data, which is the combination of Laparib and Bevacizumab trial, where they showed the biggest benefit in the HRD group, we may have access to HRD testing because currently we can't do it. There's only two commercial tests available. They cost about £3,000 each and it's not available on the NHS, but it may be a prerequisite of the, those drugs being available. Um, that um, AstraZeneca will have to provide the testing, which will be great for us and for, you know, be great for patients and us to be able to make informed decisions because we should be doing it, but we can't do it. And we've also got a question about primary peritoneal cancer and whether you, you've talked about the various um, yeah. molecular issues in the different, are they the same in primary peritoneal? They are the same, peritoneal? sorry, I should have said at the beginning, we have a bad habit of calling um, ovary cancer, ovary cancer, but actually the definition of ovarian cancer really includes fallopian tube, ovarian and primary peritoneal cancer because biologically high-grade serous peritoneal cancer, primary peritoneal is the same as high-grade serous ovary is the same as fallopian tube and they're all very similar to, to cells of origin. So that's, um, yeah, I should have defined that at the beginning because it's a common mistake that we make, um, but we, I do mean all of them and it's the same treatment, the same subtypes and the same treatment. Thank you. We've got a question about um, the timing of maintenance treatment and um, at the moment, as I understand it, it's normally started with it within weeks of finishing chemotherapy, but are there, is, is there any scope or anything coming up in the future where people might be able to start a maintenance therapy longer after they have finished either their original treatment or their maintenance therapy that they were on immediately after? So all the guidelines, it's slightly different for the different parts and the different settings, the timings. It's usually within eight weeks of six to eight weeks of finishing the chemotherapy. I think Naraparib, it might be up to 12 weeks and um, just depends on what approval they got. Um, any later than that, then it's not really maintenance treatment. It's more treatment. So as yet, there's not really any evidence to say support giving PARP inhibitors six months after you finish chemotherapy. Um, or again, switching from one maintenance treatment to straight onto another maintenance treatment. We haven't got any evidence to support that, let alone the ability to prescribe that. Um, there is a bit of flexibility, you know, if you're just over the eight week mark, um, but you know, it's not flexibility and it's not six months. Okay. And we have a question, um, I think I'm interpreting it correctly, about whether um, responding to Avastin as maintenance therapy has any bearing on whether you're defined as platinum sensitive or not with the, with, yeah, with the, the, the six month yeah. the window. Yeah. The first thing to say, so Avastin itself doesn't influence the definition of platinum sensitivity. It's defined by the last dose of platinum chemotherapy, even if you're on the Avastin treatment. Um, the definition of platinum sensitivity has changed in the last few months. It used to be a very strict six month cut, cut off. Less than six months was considered platinum resistant. There's now a consensus from all the uh, big cancer groups that 
we probably should modify that slightly and people would be considered for rechallenge of platinum or platinum sensitive if they'd responded to platinum before and it was more than six weeks and um, so the definition has changed slightly although currently for clinical trial inclusion it's still the old definition so for example if if the cancer had progressed at four months but you previously responded to platinum it wouldn't be unreasonable to try platinum again rather than it being the sort of rigid six months that 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 was in place before so that's kind of just changed recently okay. and there are questions about accessing um tumor testing for hrd if somebody hasn't been if somebody has been we told can. they've got a result or they haven't been told about any testing results is it possible to get tumor testing no, no. further down the line so uh so bracket testing should be available to everyone it's slightly different depending on where you live whether you do tumor testing or blood testing um, and even if you're further down the line, it's, it show, should still be possible to do BRCA testing. HRD testing, as I said, is not, there's not really an approved test. So I, there's only one test available by a company called Myriad and it's prohibitively expensive. It's not a perfect test either, but as yet we don't have access on the NHS or even privately, to be honest, onto a good HRD test. So people are working on that, but it's not yet possible to have it done outside a trial. And we have a question about PARP inhibitors, not like when PARP inhibitors don't work or when they work at first and then they seem to become less effective. Um, is there, a, do, do we know why that happens? I mean, it's like with all drugs, it's, it, there's lot, multiple different ways that the cancer cells can become resistant to certain treatments. Um, you know, as with chemotherapy or for example um, bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics there's a number of different ways that's why we're looking at combining PARP with other drugs so for example in the ICON-9 trial looking at whether if you give two drugs together you can prolong the benefit of PARP and delay resistance like we give two chemotherapy drugs together and it probably um, reduces resistance or delays resistance perhaps. We have a question about um, clear cell and you, you mentioned that clear cell looks similar to um, kidney or clear yeah, cell. Yeah. Is, is there overlap in terms of the research? So are sort of kidney specialists and ovarian specialists that working together on, on research or how is that overlapping looked at? Not really. In that, when I said that they look, I just mean if you look at them at a sort of genetic level, there's more similarity, so they would match more. But they're still very dis dis different diseases. Um, but um, extrapolating from what we know about kidney cancer, where immunotherapy is very effective, and what we know of early stage clear cell, you would imagine that clear cell ovary cancer would respond better to immunotherapy than some of the other types. So they're not, I, I don't want to confuse things, it's not the same disease, it's just there's more similarities between clear cell kidney and clear cell ovary than there is between clear cell ovary and serous ovary, for example. But it's still very much a distinct disease from clear cell kidney cancer. And uh, we're just sort of coming up to, coming up to time, but um, you mentioned that um, PARP inhibitors, if they're going to be used, they're normally sort of started very, very soon after the end of chemotherapy. So can you say a little bit more about what um, influences um, whether somebody is, is eligible for a PARP inhibitor I and mean, does it depend on whether they on their surgery or their stage? So for in the first line setting it's it's for stage three and four disease and in both the first line setting and the recurrent setting there has to have been a response to platinum chemotherapy so um, the cancer either has to have reduced or at least stabilized with a reduction in the C125 on the platinum based chemotherapy. Now obviously in the first line setting if you had primary surgery and there was no disease left then we've got nothing to measure but so there has to be no evidence of the cancer having grown on chemotherapy so they have to be concerned that have platinum sensitive and responded to chemotherapy. So if you had chemotherapy, platinum chemotherapy and it hadn't worked, then PARP inhibitor wouldn't be the right thing to do. Um, it, that wouldn't be the right treatment. And we've had a couple of questions in about the duration of treatment with PARP inhibitors. So once you've been prescribed one and you've started taking it, how long do you, you take it for? And yeah, is, so is that different for the different PARP inhibitors? Like the same? Yeah, that's right. So in the in the case context of recurrent ovarian cancer, cancer that's come back, the PARP inhibitors, Alaprib, Niraprib and Rocaprib, you take them for as long as they're working and, and they're, so for as long as they're controlling the cancer and, and you're tolerating them, then you can stay on them for a long time. So as I presented from the solo two study, 25% of patients have been on for five years. Um, it's slightly different in the first 
fine setting, so the new indications, um, and it's slightly different depending on the PARP inhibitor. So a laparib in the first line setting for a BRCA mutant stage three or four cancer is two years of a laparib, and niraparib for non-BRCA is three years. And that's really just the way the trials were designed. Um, so there's slight nuances to that. So in the first line setting, it's a defined amount of time, but in the recurrent setting, it's for as long as it's working and people are tolerating it. Okay. And, a, and there's a similar question in relation to Avastin about the duration of treatment. So Avastin is, is, a set, is a set duration, it's 18 cycles, so it depend, it's about a year. It depends if you start it with your first chemotherapy or maybe not your fourth or fifth one after your operation. So, But it's 18 cycles in total, so it's just over a year of treatment in total. Right, okay. Right. So we're just coming up to seven o'clock, so I think we'll so what I'll do we, we have that's most of the questions or cover most of the issues that have been brought up I think but um, if but have but we'll have another sort of look through the questions and if there is anything that perhaps it would be helpful to, to get some um, some follow-up on we'll mm -hmm. um, if you're happy to to perhaps um, take a look at those and we'll um, and we'll circulate that to the to everybody who's who's joined the webinar this evening so Thank you ever so much again for I say for packing so much into. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's a lot of information. Of one evening. Up, it's hard to select which ones to go into. So yeah, so you know, we're really grateful, and you, and you really sort of uh, sort of push across how you know how much is happening, as in how much has happened recently in terms of developments, but also what's what's happening with with research and new sort of possibilities, um, you know, that we're looking forward to as well. So there's a lot to, to keep an eye on. I would just say to anyone, if, if, if it's ever a time that you need to have treatment, it's always worth exploring what clinical trials are, op are available and asking around if, if that's something that you're interested in, because there's lots of opportunities to participate in research if that's something that you're keen on. Okay. Okay, so thank you ever so much, Dr. Miller, and thank you so much to everybody who has who's joined the webinar this evening and who's asked, asked questions and engaged with us and uh, we, we hope to see you at another one of our webinars or events soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.